Welcome to the 15th edition of Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by the tall Banega Swast India at Front Lawn. We are delighted to introduce Watersheds. This session is presented by Hero Future Energies and to be introduced by Bhavna Kirpal Mittal. I would please request her to come on stage now. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Can I see some hands? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so happy to be here. We are privileged that Hero Future Energies partnered with Jaipur Literature Festival. I personally have been longing to be part of this. Uh, unfortunately, could not uh, attend in the previous years. And thankfully, this year we are here. Thanks to the organizers. Uh, the topic that we have picked or the next session that is that will happen is watersheds. Why water? I studied in Rajasthan and from the beginning when I was here studying, people kept saying, Rajasthan mein paani ki kami hai. Is it only in Rajasthan? I don't think so. Over the years, I think this problem has grown immensely all over the world. I am reminded of a phrase by someone where it says it takes a lot of blue to stay green. Have you heard about it? Anyone? Can, can I see hands raised? Yes. Do you think it is relevant? Quite relevant. So we talk about greening the world, but for greening the world, we need water. So can we afford to decrease blue? No way. Water is the driving force of all nature and it is the most important and essential natural resource for life on earth. We know that water is the key driver for economic and social development and it is the main component that contributes towards the integrity of natural environment. Almost 2.2 billion people do not have access to clean and safe water managed facilities. Hydrologists say that from 1960 to 2000, there have been depletion in water table or say the abstraction of water has increased from almost 300 to 700 cubic kilometer per year and the water uh, groundwater depletion has increased from 120 to almost 280 cubic centimeter uh, kilometer per year. This is huge. If at this pace we keep on depleting the water table, just imagine what will happen in 2030. As per the reports of WHO and UNICEF, billions of people will not have access to clean drinking water and hygiene facilities by 2030. This is quite alarming. There is a need to develop equitable, efficient and sustainable programs for water management. Now, how will that happen? A person, an individual cannot do anything alone. But yes, if we all join hands, and I'm so happy that JLF team included the topic of clean energy, which happened, I think, three, four days back, the session on clean energy, and uh, now water, uh, which shows seriousness of every body, every institute towards preserving and conserving this important natural resource. Now, there is one more saying that pure water is the first and foremost medicine. I hope you must have heard about it. But you will be surprised to know that as per the reports of again WHO and UNICEF, three out of 10 people could not wash hands with safe, water, clean, safe and clean water during the pandemic. Isn't that this a serious situation? And if you believe the words of WHO Director General, he says that it is important to protect this 
natural resource because it will contribute towards ending the pandemic. We are still thinking and uh, asking if the third, fourth wave will come or not, fifth wave. Some people say that there will be a total seven waves, whatever. People are predicting a lot, but the, the underlying fact is we need to protect our hands, ourselves, by sanitizing and using clean water to wash the hands. Uh, it's, it, I mean, it seems unbelievable because I think most of us sitting here have access to clean water, but imagine of the regions of localities of communities who don't have. Now coming to uh, India, uh, there was a report of 2020 which said that uh, uh, in India, more than 50% of the population do not have access to clean drinking water. I am privy to this because I have visited rural areas, not only in Rajasthan, but in other states. And I've seen people, rural population, who don't have access to uh, the, the clean water. They have been consuming water with algae. It was green color. But the worst part is that they are not even aware of that it is unhealthy for them. So, and we know that government and other bodies, uh, groups have been educating a lot, spreading awareness. But if they don't have access to clean drinking water, where will they go? They don't, they have no choice. Either they change their habitation or they consume it. So, uh, with the, with the kind of efforts that are required from all individuals, we at Hero Future Energies aim to contribute towards water, not only providing clean drinking water services to the communities where we install our projects. And just to, just to give you a brief that at Hero Future Energies, uh, we are installing solar, wind, hybrid, um, new technology projects in the area of clean. So, our, our tagline is planet positive power. So we are producing clean power for the planet. But with this, our priority remains water. So we have been installing water ATMs in the communities, wherein uh, we extract water and then we clean it through RO and uh, provide it to the community. We have been developing uh, water harvesting structures, which help farmers to get water for their fields and grow crops and increase the chances of their livelihood. Someone can ask that, you know, uh, at our solar PV projects, we use water to clean uh, the panels. Yes, it's right, but there are new technologies and we have been installing those and looking at uh, deploying at all the project sites, which are dry cleaning facilities, robotic cleaning, which consume less water. So we'll continue to focus on it. And I'm so happy that and glad that we got this opportunity to share our endeavors with all of you. And kudos to the JLF team to focus on this important topic. And I hope the, the, the panel members that will uh, be presenting to you about watersheds, I hope you all will enjoy uh, the session. Uh, have a nice day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Vavna. The climate has changed and remains in a constant state of flux. In adapting to this new and hotter world, water thus takes center stage. While India faces its worst water crisis ever, some believe that by 2030, it will fail to meet half its water demands. In conversation with Neha Sinha, author and founder of the Sundaram Climate Institute, Mridula Ramesh takes us through 4,000 years of history to track how India's water crisis has reached the point it is at and the best way forward to deal with this unfolding crisis. Mridula Ramesh is the author of the critically acclaimed book, The Climate Solution, and the founder of the Sundar Climate Institute, which focuses on waste and water solutions. Ramesh worked at McKinsey in Silicon Valley and is the executive director of Sundaram Textiles. She's a part of the Board of Trustees of World Wildlife Fund India and chairperson of the Board of Governors at the National Institute of Technology, Andhra Pradesh. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Mridula Ramesh. Neha Sinha is a conservation biologist, author, and columnist. Her critically acclaimed first book, Wild and Willful, tells the story of 15 of India's most iconic wild species. Sinha heads conservation and policy at the Bombay Natural History Society and is a leading commentator on the environment, writing for Hindustan Times, The Hindu, Bloomberg, Quint, Telegraph, and others. She's the 2017 recipient of the Wildlife Service Award by the Century Asia Foundation. Neha Sinha, over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for being here for this most important topic. We always say that water will cause the third world war. Well, probably we are looking at a third world war, but there's probably another war coming on water as well. We're actually going to start with a short presentation. So may I request the presentation to be played? Slightly scary and horrifying, but I hope you enjoy it. Excuse me. Um, I think it, to err is human. To really screw up takes a computer. So while we wait, um, I'll just read a couple of lines from the book. Water can rage, it can trickle, water can gush, and it can caress. Water can overcome, or it can disappear. Water has no substitute. Can we start the presentation? Can we start the presentation, please? Yeah, the next slide. So what, you know, we all have, I think most of you, may have a bottle of water or some uh, water in, with you. And you think it's mundane because it looks so ordinary and everyday. But it's not. India's water is like a hypercharged stallion. It's completely different from any other water of the world. And one of the facets, I mean, uh, Neha is a conservation biologist. And if she was to look at an animal, she would describe it with certain characteristics. So what are the characteristics of India's water? First, it's geographically so varied. We're sitting here in Rajasthan. Jaisalmer gets uh, 165 millimeters of rain in a full year, spread over a few days. I was in Madras in um, three months ago. We got 20, 200 millimeters of rain in four hours. The northeast, just on the other side of the country, gets meters of rainfall like five meters of rainfall in a matter of months. I mean, just from there to there. So the, the first facet of India's water, if you were to look at it as a wildlife uh, uh, species, is it's geographically varied. And for most of India's history, we find that we lived in consonance with India's water. We grew what the local water would uh, you know, support. And what is really interesting is, our food was like that. When I come to Rajasthan, I want to eat, uh, you know, kersangri and dal bati and all of those things, which are crops that grow with the dry area. When I go to Kerala, I want to eat boiled rice. When I go to Bengal, I want to eat fish. And, you know, when you go to the Northeast, you want to sample the different varieties of rice. And for most of India's history, we lived in consonance with the water. And the taxes you know, supported that. They, we paid a variable tax and that supported those crops. But about when the British came, they said, you know what, we'll do a fixed tax. And we'll do a, you have to pay it in cash though. You can't pay it in kind. The moment that came in, farmers chose to grow cash crops. The forest started making way for wheat, for sugarcane, for indigo, for cotton, for rice. The grassland started making way. And with that, we developed the first water fault line, as it were. Can we go to the next slide, please? This is the second facet of India's water. And this is something we don't get at all. This is a graph on seasonality. And the higher the graph, the more seasonal India's water is. We get, India gets most of its water from the monsoon. And it's one of the most seasonal wa waters in the world. Right. And um, I was listening to someone, the, I think the director of the National Institute of Hydrology, 
and india gets most of its water in just 100 hours so it's not a gentle pitter patter of rain it's a sledge hammer falling down right and the next slide please and this is really important for indian cities if you look at it this is the number of days on which it rains right and european cities so european city design is takes into mind that it will rain more or less constantly throughout the year but you look at the extreme end of the graph and that's all the indian cities and we don't get that much that many rain days okay and um, again this was not so much of a problem but today we are urbanized each of us wants this oops sorry <laughs> uh, each of us wants this water bottle every day so you get this very seasonal water and you get every day demand and what do you need to match the two you need storage and that's the one thing we've done an outstanding job in stamping out of our cities next slide please so why do you care why are we in a crisis right so we've we why is our water suddenly misbehaving so you take this very spirited stallion which is very different from the different waters of the world and then you add climate change climate change takes each facet and then puts it on steroids it takes geographic variability and makes dry regions drier and wet regions wetter it takes seasonal variability it makes wet seasons wetter and dry seasons drier it takes uh, the number of rain days we already have so few and it makes them smaller still and then when it does rain it pours so with any luck this is the change of temperature over the last 150 years so yellow is hot uh, yellow is warm red is hot and i can't see and i think if you can see the years uh, this is the 1940s the 60s the 80s the 90s and that's today right it's warmed by about a degree and most of you may be thinking a degree is not a lot if you go from here to the darbar hall it's much much colder but you know the problem with that degree is that one degree supercharges the water cycle the next slide please and again i apologize if you can't see and this is the number of storms and floods in india and the damage toll and you can see that climate i mean when i hear about climate change people talk about the need to cut emissions and i think that's really important because the way we are headed we're going we are on track to warm well above 2 degrees but the climate itself speaks through water and i heard an excellent quote which i've put um in the book if climate change is a shark then water is its teeth and that shark is biting india really really hard so with that we'll start thank you so much for that one of the most interesting lines in your book is that snow builds civilizations and in a hot country like india we don't think much about snow we do think a bit about water but usually we are flooding or we are in the middle of drought so one of the main aspects of your book is that water is everywhere or issues of water are everywhere but water is still invisible for us so can you tell us a bit more about that that's a great question how many of you want like brought to mind that you had water in your bottle were really conscious about it how many of you fetched it from the source and made sure you filled it into your bottle and bought it here today water is invisible because we don't exert any kind of effort to get it to where we want to and the problem is that's the underlying driver of why india has a dysfunctional relationship with our water all relationships work in the same you know two things make them dysfunctional one you don't understand the other person we don't understand our water we don't understand that it's this volatile variable thing that needs to be managed it's not a one size fit all and in a in a dysfunctional relationship you don't acknowledge the other person we don't and that's why we are the way we are because it's become invisible we take it for granted and therefore we abuse it and then that sets off this So we've just had the new IPCC report on climate change. It was recently published the assessment report, the sixth assessment report, the second part of it, and it's very interesting because it says very specifically for Indian cities are going to be in uninhabitable. That you know the 
either the sea levels will rise or there'll be tropical cyclones or there'll be a huge lack of water. So a lot of that IPCC report is actually about water. One of the things it also says is that coal plants will become harder to use because they use a lot of water and we don't have so much water. And one of the most important points in your book is, of course, that water needs to be taken much more seriously in the climate discourse. So when we talk about climate, we talk about carbon, but uh, water is also really important. And like you're saying, it's the shark and the teeth, and those teeth are biting us right now. So do tell us a bit more about why water is so important for the climate story. I think it's especially important for India, and I'll tell you why. It's perfectly clear, you know, you saw the graphs, but it's, it's perfectly clear that we've crossed certain climate thresholds. It's gone. It, we're in, we're in a, the climate has changed. It's not going to change. And all of the graphs you saw that, that staccato rise, you know, that straight line rising of the damage from floods and droughts, that's already baked in and it's only going to get worse. So, you know, you need to start managing the water, right? It's not going to go away. Even if you cut emissions, which we're not doing, this, this warming and its effects are going to stay. So a good way to think about it is, um, it's political to choose a movie, but you know, you choose a movie like say Dirty Picture. Who do you remember? Do you remember Vidya Balan's uh, great performance? Or do you remember the executive director? Uh, executive producer. Water is the lead actress of the climate change crisis. Carbon is the executive producer, right? You need to manage carbon, absolutely. But water is what it's about. And unless we start giving water its fair share of narrative in the climate change discourse, that's not, you're not, you're never going to give it the importance. You're never going to acknowledge it. And then you're never going to be able to manage it. So a large part of your book, um, Ridula, is about your personal journey of saving water, that when you moved to your uh, place of residence, you were running out of water and you started buying it. And once you started buying it, you realize, you know, how expensive it was, how difficult it was to procure it. And then you started this very interesting journey and you call it a journey you're not you're not saying you've reached there but you're still on a journey to save water through rainwater harvesting and through many other interventions using the RO water in your garden for example so tell us a bit I'm sure the audience would love to learn you know what we can learn from a personal journey of every family saving water really so one of the things I typically hear in the water discourses it's the government's problem to solve right? Policy needs to happen and the government needs to solve our problem. And I think because just how variable water is, um, we forget by saying that we are denying ourselves our own power, right? So I knew nothing about climate. I knew very little about water before we ran out of water in our house. So day zero came home to roost in 2013. And we had drilled well past 500 feet in our bow well. So a friend was saying, you're mining for water and our mind ran dry. And we were paying lots and lots of money. So finally water became visible until the bore well was running and you know, life was okay. It was invisible. The bore well ran out as it is running out in many parts of India and water became visible and in a, not in a great way. But once, you know, you just, there's a bulb that goes off in your or a switch that turns in your mind and you say, it's my problem and I have to solve it. It's amazing how many solutions come up. First, we had no idea how much water we were using, indeed, where we were using our water. So we put meters, right? And we figured out meters and we realized that the garden, which looked beautiful, like this garden, was using a lot of water. And this water, you know, it was, uh, had to be transported and used. And the kitchen was using water. So then, you know, how can you reduce that water? There were leaks, right? There was pressure. Then our RO plant was rejecting oodles of water, which was happily going into the sewage. So we used our, we tested and used our RO reject water. So no water goes out. And why I say it's a journey is once you say it's my problem and I have to solve it, every day you learn something new. Like in the last 
we stopped buying water in 2015 and in the worst drought in madurai we have a friend from uh, madurai sitting in the audience the worst drought of madurai where uh, every house was buying water we didn't buy water and that was because we were very aware of how we were using it and where it was coming from and it's a journey because we had huge floods and then one day we saw our rain water our rain water was running into the road and it, we just put a ditch it's not very expensive it's very simple and channeled it in and that just builds up the groundwater resilience we use compost a lot of the stories in the book but i'll stop there but i think the most important thing is the moment you say it's my problem there's a huge amount of power that it opens up and it's not just my story i think the it's a grim story yes day zero is increasingly i think in jaipur i don't need to tell the audience this but it's increasingly coming the flood is coming it's it's everywhere but nearly half of the book is about people who've solved their water problems so and it all starts with it's my problem to solve so when we think about india we think about rivers we think about forests we don't always connect rivers to forests but if i were to talk about which my favorite forests are you know probably the central indian forest kanha bandhavgarh etc a lot of tiger reserves have rivers and that's because forests actually create water bodies and sustain water bodies and forests are not spoken about when we talk about water at all so it's like fresh water is coming from the sky we think about the monsoon but we don't think about how important forests are for uh, water security and for sequestering water so one of the aspects of your book of course is that forests are very important and we need to restore them we need to maintain them we need to not degrade them so can you tell us a bit about that natural infrastructure which is the forest which keeps our water so for the audience i think how the forest uh, influences water is we saw how seasonal india's water is so if you get rain in the monsoon what are you going to do for uh, the water in the summer and that's where forests come in because the forest trap the water it pulls the water into the ground and slowly releases it over time and maintains the dry season flow so i think the most important function of forest it's a seasonal modulator so it takes water in the when it rains and gives it when you need it the most the second thing forest do is it cleans the water up right it it's a wonderful cleaning service that the forest uh, does the third is it reduces flooding so when you think of forest as a natural adaptation to water where do you find the forests of india you find them on the slopes of kerala where it rains a lot you find them in the northeast where it rains a lot you find them in the central indian highlands where it rains a lot and that there is seasonal adaptation to you know hold on to the soil to provide the structural scaffolding if you will uh to anchor the soil hold it in place against such torrential rain and then of course um, i'm going to use a tamil saying um kaludeke therima karpura vasane so i mean does a donkey appreciate the smell of camphor we go and cut the forests in uh you know where you get torrential rainfall and uh, then we are surprised that we are having floods and landslides and all of that but i think we've been when i think of the issue of forests um, you have two issues you have a lack of understanding which is many people are not aware of this how forests are related to water but you also have a lack of imagination today the value of forests okay 60% of the way forests are valued by the government when you have to divert forest lies in the timber value of the trees it's a very you know it's a, it's a mindset from 150 years ago you're literally missing the forest for the trees water which is so critical i mean all of us are paying so much for summer water is i think less than 3% of the value of the forest and more importantly the forests are very critical to the communities that live around them but the services the goods and services that they get and i'm i'm putting on my business hat here we're not thinking about it imaginatively enough that those communities really 
get better cash flow from the forest not by diverting forests but by keeping forests intact so i go into several models in the book of how you can keep forests intact but at the same time uh, give better cash flow to the local community so they are very vested in keeping them secure so there's a portion in your book in which you talk about delhi the city of delhi the national capital such a big city in its own right it's 1400 square kilometers but delhi has gone really wrong when it comes to water hasn't it and delhi has forgotten its history and the old bawlis etc so can you tell us what delhi did wrong and what it can do right just really quickly because it's of interest to most cities of india so in the first draft of the draft of the book was done and then i shared it with my publisher and uh, Uh, my editor told me this looks like uh, the book on south india's water <laughs> this is uh, so they said okay fine let's do the balance right and so i started looking at delhi and delhi's water and what's really interesting is delhi's history the many cities of delhi's uh, the many cities of delhi can actually be looked as an adaptation to water if you look at one of the earliest uh some say you know uh the archaeological evidence of delhi it lay next to the river the yamuna and the yamuna was always called the fickle one she was shivering all the time and that was a metaphor for the fact that she changed her course very often and indeed there is archaeological evidence that flood overcame cities uh the so the purana kila they found evidence of flood and um um uh, how you know that is probably what overcame the city then the next avatar of delhi you find is higher up the ridge so you're further away from the river but the moment you go up the ridge you don't have water very easily available right in the next to the delhi they found a ring well so water was available at very shallow a ring well is uh, like concentric uh, circles of terracotta put inside and you draw water up from a few feet but then you move up to the 10th century uh, 11th century you start seeing suraj kund because the need to store water at higher areas and once you store water ground water gets recharged so local houses can be uh, can draw their water up from a local well but really interestingly is when times get troubled you want the high ground so you move up to meheroli and uh, you know um, uh, lal kot and the next avatar of delhi comes there but there you have no water at shallow depths so storage becomes very important so the hossi shamsi comes up and what is really sad is when you go through the history uh, and and i'm going to talk about two instances the climate is changing now and we're all hot and bothered about it but we forget that the climate has changed many times in the past and th- there is now good evidence as a new unfolding form of evidence where they take stalactites and stalagmites from caves look at the ratios of oxygen isotope like different forms of oxygen and say how did it rain then and you get very you know because you saw india's water is so variable you can actually piece together how it uh, rained and how the temperature was how the climate was and the 13th and 14th century was a time when it was drying up uh i think there was some accounts of even cannibalism it was so dry and then you start seeing a period of unrest where so many dynasties changed and um one of the bawlis that i really enjoy and thankfully it's been restored is the nizamuddin bawli and i don't know whether you've uh, been there and a friend of mine went there it's very unassuming bawli it's unfortunately quite dirty and um, you know it's just people believe it's uh, it's very holy to bathe there but they unfortunately leave their clothes also but when i was standing there babar mentions the you know the nizamuddin shrine by name he stood there that bawli has held water from babar through independence the rise and fall of the mughals uh you know delhi's many water crises it's held water all the time and it's right in our midst and we ignore it and at least that bawli has water it's somewhat secure and i don't know whether you can open up the presentation again because uh there is one photo in the presentation i'd like to show i don't know whether you can if you can great if not we'll have to manage without it it's in the book uh my friend and i decided to hunt for the oldest bawli in delhi it's a 
9th to 10th century bauli called anangtal bauli and uh, we went to meroli and we asked a guard there he point, pointed us to another bauli it ended up being gandak ki bauli then he, they somebody said it's near the yogmaya temple so we went to the yogmaya temple and we asked a guy he said madam i've lived here for 50 years i've never seen a bauli like this then finally the guard got very excited and he said madam i found it so then he takes us and there's a landfill there's a complete landfill this you know pads this broken glass this you know every form of rubbish you can imagine my friends like hello we've come this far let's just go and of course i had gone to present something so i was wearing a sari and high heels which i would not recommend to anyone who wants to walk through a landfill and uh, we crossed the landfill and there in in a clump of trees was the anangtal bauli and i thought it was a wonderful representation of our relationship with water once upon a time this was a bauli in a dry re- area in upper ridge it was valued built and it was a, it had a functional relationship with the community and now it's just tossed and forgotten and sitting next to a landfill so barbers bauli still exists what are the three things we can all do to save water in our everyday lives just three questions uh, it is what i learned and what has bought me water security in my life and um, in the lives of all the people i've profiled how much water did you use today where did it come from and where is it going i think if you answer these questions and say it's my responsibility to uh, ask and answer these questions and manage those answers i'm i don't guarantee things but i think we can be reasonably sure that you will be more water secure than you are today thank you thank you thank you so much i'm just going to open the floor quickly for any questions if you might have them yes the gentleman in the blue shirt uh, a mic will come to you hello ma'am ma'am what is your take in uh, water linking projects like kn betwa and uh, the one solution for bundain kal um so i've gone into water linking projects and um uh, uh you know how it looks and let's look at why water linking right they say look india's water is so geographically variable so why don't we take water from a surplus place and give it to a place with less water and the second argument which actually in the interlinking project they provide for is storage which india has abysmal it's gone into it in the book and storage is the single most important thing that you can do actually i'll go back sorry i'll just go back to the three things you do please adopt your nearest bauli i mean we've studied this uh, any water body when the community adopts it the bauli is healthy so please adopt your nearest uh, thing so we don't have enough storage so that's a way of thinking about it but if you look at the corn and i'll start with the non hydrological corn first um somebody has to the upstream water haver has to give water to the downstream water starved country and let me just talk about some of the linking projects that have already existed recently chennai had its floods no right andhra pradesh was very generous in giving the water during the time of flood saying please take it chennai was like no 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 we are already flooded but they said no 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 you please take it during the summer water we don't get the krishna water so it you always get in these linking projects there's always an upstream neighbor and a downstream neighbor and the upstream neighbor will give water when they don't need it which is the monsoon when the downstream neighbor also doesn't need it and rarely does water get shared very well and as tamil nadu a very downstream street i'm fully aware of that reality the second thing right and that's the seasonality of india's water and i think that really needs to get etched into our mind the second thing is a lot of the linkages um and i'm not going to go into direct linkages uh, result in the submergence of forests right i think it brings up two arguments and i think neha will uh, uh, also agree with this one do other species have any rights to our water or not i think that's a philosophical question which can be answered across many different fields and that's a question we have to answer the second is the we just saw 
forest add to water and i've just gone through three reasons but for there is emerging evidence that forest seed rainfall especially in downstream regions because of the evaporation and transpiration from leaves so are you really killing the goose that lays the golden eggs by submerging forest when you're making these links so i think there are many more reasons i've gone into but this may be why the thinking is and this may be the con i think like all forms of redistribution this also has side effects thank you we have time for one more question yes uh, gentleman in the red shirt uh, hi my name is anand and uh, i just wanted to point out one thing and not with any uh, criticism but uh, the majority of the the percentage of water that is being used for agriculture is the highest probably somewhere around 70% the rest 20 is used by industry and the remaining 10 probably is for domestic and other purposes so your idea saying that it is my responsibility it is absolutely correct but even though if all of us around the world keep doing that it's not going to change unless the larger policies on the uh, agricultural and the industrial front change one secondly uh, this is a question that i need to ask uh, i am also a researcher in groundwater so uh, what i have seen in the trends is that either we worry about the potable water which we require to drink or the water which is in the oceans like the plastic patch we don't care about the coastal waters and the highly contaminated water from uh, the coastal cities it goes into the oceans and the second thing is you might know that uh, because you have worked in southern india there's high salinization of coastal aquifers in chennai and all the cities so what kind of policy is being uh, i don't know if people or the in, in the government are even aware of these things uh, so that is something when it comes to climate change those places are going to be the most affected but there's no i'm going to have to stop you because we're really out of time uh, there's one more question shall we just take it really quickly the lady next to you and you'll have to answer quickly because we're out of time hi lovely session uh, just to answer the gentleman before there are these two policies like the swachh bharat mission urban 2.0 and amrut 2.0 that are very focused on water in fact uh, sbm urban 2.0 is focused on use water management which is what my question is to you ma'am that uh, you know with this whole debate on how the third question that you asked where is our water going so in order to achieve a circular economy where the water that we have is never waste we keep using it and using it and using it how do you think we can build our cities that are actually not sustainable uh, you know for something like use water management how do you think the government can uh, you know do course correction now okay so let me go very quickly on the agriculture yeah. it's it's in the book i've looked at 4000 years of agriculture specifically punjab and haryana from indus valley what they grew to what they grow now i think we forget that we decide what we eat and what the government buys so i'll leave it there and i'll leave it to the book on the sewage great question i think if we manage our sewage we can become resilient i call it the brahmastra in our back pocket because it overcomes geographic variability because we go to the bathroom every day it's it's not seasonal it's not temporarily skewed it overcomes every facet policy is only the one first step bangalore has a fabulous policy on retreating sewage and i've looked at the bangalore case study in the book it says bulk users have to retreat their sewage and in a more naive version of myself i would have said that's it and a job done but bangalore has a hellishly flaming and foaming lake and the hay, the lake flames because of the methane which is untreated sewage so what is really important and i think a lot of people including the government are getting their heads around this decentralized treatment of sewage right so each apartment house whatever treats retreats their own sewage and if you want to go wild with it go wild with it use gray water black water i mean once you think about it and really think about it it's great because Uh, and i give the example of the two factories that we did the first factory we didn't know anything we just put something that met the regulation and we went ahead with it for the second factory we had time to look around so we went for a solution that has zero opex i'll go as far as to say zero opex looks quite lovely and uh, 
you know gives me water resilience right i don't have to go anywhere else it's my water it's my sewage it's coming back to my farms and it's great for the farms so i think decentralized is the one word i would use and i think as we start thinking about water as our water you start thinking about your sewage as your sewage and i think on that day we will find the true circular economy going that's a great way to end our water is our water our sewage is our sewage thank you so much for writing this important book it's very global but it's also very local it's very contextual so i hope more people read it we need more serious scholarship in environment and i'm glad we are starting thank you so much and thank you everyone for the lovely questions and for attending thank you neha on that no thank you madhura ramesh and neha sinha we thank hero future energies for their support we request you to please accept our token of love and appreciation Please note that Mridula will be signing the book at the book signing desk, which is located just behind the seating at the front lawn. And it is kind of essential to make this announcement right after this session that we encourage all of you to implement the conscious reuse of water bottles. There are water dispensers to refill them. Furthermore, we request you to please dispose of all the rubbish in the designated.